Good day, everyone. It's 11.31, we're gonna start. We have a good number of representatives and we only have 29 minutes with you and we have a very exciting agenda. So with great delight, I um, in welcome you to the Influencing Change Towards Sustainability Workshop, Nature-Based Education. We have two wonderful speakers, Kaplan and Wolfram today, who have a deep background, passion, experience in this field. They're gonna do two short talks of five, six minutes. So we have lots of time for interaction with you. But who am I? I'm your host. My name is Sean Southey. I am the chair of IUCN's Commission on Education and Communication, the CEC. The CEC is a network of almost 2,000 people from around the world who care about the communication side of nature, the education side of nature, and in their hearts want a bigger tent, a bigger constituency, a bigger community from Hungary to Chile to India, all sharing, celebrating, and creating a deeper connection with nature. Both Wolfram and Kathleen are CEC members. In fact, Kathleen is the deputy of the commission and my dear colleague, uh, but they have something else in common. They're both very passionate about nature for all. And Nature for All is a program you're going to hear about in this session. And Nature for All works on the theory of change that when we connect to nature, when we love nature, that it changes everything we do in life. It changes the way we educate ourselves, it changes the way we vote, it changes the way we Every time she unmutes, she mutes everybody, she mutes me as well. So I keep having to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's good to be put in one's place every so often. So Nature for All is about connecting and about love. So while we hear these two presentations, I'd love you to do something for Kathleen, for Wolfram and for me and for each other. I'd like you to share in the chat box in a short written sense, when did you fall in love with nature? When did you fall in love with nature? Who were you with? Where were you? What was that moment when you fell in love with nature? And we're gonna call that back later as we respond to your questions. And I think it's a very powerful point to look at how we amplify a global community of conservation and care. Our first presenter today is Kathleen. Kathleen is Hungarian. I have had the great pleasure of working with um, Kathleen for four years on a, on a weekly, if not daily basis. She's one of my favorite conservationists, one of my favorite educators. Her passion is profound. Um, at the moment, if you look just to her left in the picture, that wonderful book up there is her newest publication just out this week, last week. Um, uh, and being translated now into English for later. Um, Kathleen has both international and Hungarian experience, is also you, Hungary's uh, focal point to UNESCO. So she sits really at the interface between education, communication, and environment. Over to you, Kathleen. Have fun. Thank you, Sean. I can't resist to say some words about that book at the end, but let's start a little bit earlier. So you asked when we fall in love with nature. I was grew up in a small village and I spent most of my life, except sleeping outdoor. Uh, sometimes I was gardening with my mother. Sometimes I just played with my friends in the nearby meadow or in a creek. I didn't know how privileged we were. Uh, that time I thought that nature has been being always there and it will be always day. And when we went to the capital, because my grandparents lived there, uh, I felt that I'm seeing the, the developed world, the future we want. Uh, it, was, it was something that uh, I wanted to live and later we made it. I had my studenthood in the university in, in, the, in the capital and later at the beginning of my career, I was invited to run a nomadic camp somewhere in the small hills in Hungary, 10 days 
without electricity, without built infrastructure, without shops nearby, and without cell phones. Can you imagine? I felt immediately at home. Uh, we run that camps uh, with my fellow students, or I, I already graduated, but with some uh, students, mainly from biology teacher students, um, uh, geology physics student, but we had economists, we had uh, psychologists and even astronomy students with us. We could see the world through each other's eyes and we could put together the puzzle for ourselves and for the children, what the life means around. We were so happy there. And um, later I became uh, a mother and my daughters who were there from their, even from their, I don't know, from my pregnancy, uh, wanted to have the camps I wanted to be the full right in the camps as a participant, not being echo pining with their mother. So I stopped going there. I transferred the leadership and also the, the first campers wanted to try their leadership wings. So we passed the leadership on and it was more than 35 years ago and the camps are still going on. They are doing, the leadership is, has a very organic turnover and they are bringing children year by year. And we made a little research and we realized that these camps change many of ours, I mean the leaders and the, and the students life as well. What is it if not the transformative education? We are talking throughout this conference because for those of you who are not uh, participants of the World Conference of the UNESCO on Education, for Sustainable Development 2030. Uh, I'm just explaining there is a, a Congress and this webinar is a presentation of the IUCN Commission and, uh, and the Bavarian Academy of Nature Conservation uh, shared boot. And they are screening from the Congress and in the Congress there were several speeches already by scientists and experts on the transformative education and why the education for sustainability is important. So we, we have the two type of audience and I just try to explain. And in, the, in, in that book that we have resources, but we are going to share with you here in, this, in the chat box as well. And also we are uh, filming some videos and the whole presentation will be uh, screened and can be seen later on. So let's go back. Let's see those influences I was explaining, the, those changes, the behavioral change from a different perspective. Later on, I was invited or I joined the IUCN Commission on Education and Communication. And last year, we were thinking to ask our members what the futures of education means. In this commission, we have more than 2000 uh, people who are committed for education, communication, behavioral science. We have different stories in our life, but we have shared vision. And we wanted to form this shared vision. Probably many of you who are participating already uh, contributed to that visions and recommendation paper. So we asked our members, how do you see the futures of education and why? And we prepared the report, it's shared, you can see it on the CEC website as well. But in this report, besides having different personal stories, we have a shared vision. Let me to write because, let me to read it because I think it's, it's important to, to phrase well. So sustainability can be only achieved if, if we as humankind stay below the carrying capacity of our planet. And we let, we live the life that led the processes of ecological system to sustain all basic conditions and resources for our life. Therefore, the education has to incorporate a more holistic and integrated living systems approach and to inspire and reestablish deep connections between humans and nature. We already initiated Nature for All. We already, uh, we have these experiences from our whole life, but
but it was good to see that more than 150 experts all around the world contributed to this statement. And, and in the Nature for All, two years ago or three years ago, our colleagues analyzed researches, more than 120 researches, to find out what leads uh, to the conservation behavior, how connection with nature leads to a conservation behavior. And one evidence we quote a lot is that having positive experience in a wild or a semi-wild territory with a model a role, with a role model has a long lasting experience. Many adults who has a pro sustainability, I mean pro environment, uh, pro conservation uh, behavior, explain that stories. They were somewhere with a role model. And what, what the message is for the educators, I hope we have so many educators with us here, a teacher, who helps the student have positive experiences and shows how he or she loves the place and connects the children to that are a role model. Our young adults, our students, the leaders of the camps are role models. We are influencing our children's life for a pro-environmental behavior, for a sustainability, for, for a sustainable life. And um, there is other beside this, because we were looking in the Nature for All, it was initiated in the IUCN. Of course, we wanted to see what really leads to the pro-environmental behavior. But analyzing these researches, there are so many other evidences that shows that having some connection, even not with the wide or a national park, just even a city park, a school garden, even to be able to watch a tree from the classroom, leads to a better academic performance, a better school performance, uh, deal with uh, behavior challenges, creativity, and so many other things. So if you see these researches, you can quote these researches, but if you, if, you, if you can visit our resources, you can quote these researches. But it's amazing how connection with nature influences even our learning and also our health. So let's do something for it. Let's use this connection. Um, we have another strategic document. It's called um, Education for Conservation, because we would like to uh, show the schools and also the conservation societies how to plan education strategically to lead to the conservation behavior. But let me explain another story instead of, instead of quoting several uh, researches and report paper you, can, you are able to read. Um, thank you, Sean, mentioning this school book. When we put together, when we were planning this school book, this is a school book on sustainability. It's a curricula for the eight to nine grade students on sustainability. Uh, we had a team that has different backgrounds. I am also not a nature, nature science teacher. I am a mathematics teacher. I'm a teacher of mathematics originally. But we started to discuss what to squeeze into this curriculum or what to leave out and how to show the connection of our life and the different roles we are playing, the different behavior in the different places we are in, how to connect these things. And even with people and the teachers from different background, we agreed that we have to show the connection with the nature. We have to use nature as a basic element. The nature shows our, the systems. The nature shows how things are equalizing themselves, how they go wrong and how they go well. So we can use it. And also if we can connect our personal consumer behavior or our uh, um, decisions when we are working, when we will have our future um, jobs, or if we will be at 
leader of an NGO or a politicians, we are making decisions. How our decisions are affecting our life, uh, that the nature serve us, how, it's how, how this connection to the ecosystem, the biodiversity leads to our uh, living our life or vice versa, how, did how this works. And, and we agreed that we have to use the children's life, the different parts of their life, and to show these connections. How the vice um, maintaining of our national resources, the how vice usage of our national resources, how our vice decisions are supporting each other, and how the the well-known environmental disasters, the climate change, the water extreme connects to the nature and vice versa. And this is the basis of our life. So this is, and, and we started and we have a really great feedback from students and teachers that these connections are very important and important to know. But to be able to build these connections, we have to appreciate we have to value and we have to love the nature around us. And in the next uh, presentation, I think you will learn one method, how to build this love. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, that was wonderful. And what I love is hearing your narrative at the same time as the rest of us are getting to read these stories. Um, because the stories exactly connect to what you were saying. Many of the stories, Rosie's stories, Analuka's stories, talk about the power of a parent figure. Some people are out in nature, but some people have it in their backyard or their school. And I love that the fact that your, the real life stories match what you bring to us, Kaplan. So big thank you. Um, and thank you all for sharing your stories. Continue to share them. And if you have questions for Kaplan, please start to put them in the chat. We'll be harvesting questions from the chat to our speakers. So you can start to put your questions down. My next speaker is a model of complexity. And one thing that we know uh, in the world as environmentalists is that the world is complex. Wolfram is also complex. He is German, but he works for the Bavarian Academy of Conservation, a research and um, education organization. He is a, a, a father of two, has a PhD, of course, from Brazil, um, is a, a, a passionate uh, cartoonist, and I love that he is a photographer like me. Um, but he is an educator in his soul, but he's also very kind. So he's had technical problems in the past with Zoom. So he put his presentation together for us to avoid us having the traditional problem of Zoom problems back and forth from talks. But I did insist that Wolfram take a second to introduce himself before we show you the video of his presentation. Over to you, Wolfram. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, yeah, you, you already told a lot of, about me, but the main speak is about uh, animals and animals' life and how to use them. Uh, and I just show you the next presentation. It's on a, a video and we will share, uh, Sue, I hope you will share the link. It's also on YouTube. So you can uh, even uh, just recognize this uh, short presentation right now. And we start directly with it. And then after I can uh, be there for some questions. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, for me, as biologists, it's very easy to get excited about small and large miracles of our nature. But my key questions are, however, how is it possible to pass down this enthusiasm for nature? How do I get children or adults to take responsibility for her? And how do I get people to be excited about life? The answer, with life itself. With living animals are the best and most touchable evidence of the wonders of our nature. That's why we started Animal Life Project and later on the Eleanor Project. We bring living animals to school, into the classrooms, by experiential learning. 
We are the Bavarian Academy for Nature Conservation and Landscape Management and the Academy for Teacher Training and Personal Management. Later on, join many international partners. Some background information first. Within over 70 activities all around living animals, we teach by experience about animal needs and their habitats in the wild. The welfare of the animal in the classroom, but also in nature, is a core of all learning. You will find all necessary information on animal welfare, law, ecology and educational goals in our campaign manual. Take a look at our Ellen brochure. Let me tell you two stories of the real life with Animal Life project. One was a boy with his butterfly. Together with children we raised butterflies in the school class we fed the caterpillars of a very common species that had been previously collected in the wild. Until these pupate and some butterflies hatched. It's really an exciting day at school. After we brought the butterflies back to the exact place where we had taken the caterpillars and released the animals back into the wild. One year later, a boy told the teacher that he found his butterfly again. He said, it must have been my butterfly. It was exactly in the place where I released it. Just to think about which school campaign is still on the minds of the students after one year. The boy got outside in nature and he has visited his place again. That is exactly the connection we want to achieve. Another activity was with spiders. One girl in the class was very scared and better near panic with spiders. And as you can see, the tarantula is very impressive. <laughs> it's even for me. The girl did not even want to go into the classroom where the spider was. It must have been awful for her, mainly because otherwise she was one of the toughest students. However, the class gave her all the time. And it took good one and a half hour to get her in the room. A colleague of mine was nearly just as afraid of the girl, but she, as an adult, wanted to show that courage can overcome fear. But see for yourself, my adult colleague, she shrugs back. The girl instead gathered all up her courage and came closer and closer. Of course she wanted to be there with the other children. She wants to take part in the experience and understand why everyone else was so enthusiastic about the spider. And she made it. Look at it. The applause from this class was her confirmation. She had made it. All of this is only possible if teachers take the motivation, the time and the confidence to get there. Teachers are the key. We have to support them as far as possible. Living animals that live wild on our doorsteps can provide this enthusiasm for life itself without doubt. When you consciously hold life in your hands and you know that you are responsible for it now, this will make the difference in you. This will connect you with nature. Try it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sorry it wasn't a slideshow or it, it's a real video and I hope when you go back to the link to the YouTube video then you can watch it fluently and in a better quality. Uh, yeah, but I hope that the message is uh, transferred to you. <laughs> I personally love this format to actually see the child with the, the insect and responding and the class clapping is a thousand times more effective than a, another PowerPoint. So thank you, Wolfram. We do not have a lot of time, everyone. Um, we have four minutes left, but just so you know, Kathleen and Wolfram and I can stay on a few minutes longer and they're not going to close the room down immediately. So if you want to stop and have a, a, a dialogue after the one o'clock, uh, 12 o'clock my time, three minute finishing, you're welcome to do so. We have some great questions, but I also noticed my dear friend um, Bernard from UNESCO in the room. So I'm going to put you in the spot, Bernard. I want a comment from you 
uh, as a UNESCO focal point? What about this connection issue, this love issue? And if you have a question for Ron and Kathleen, sorry to put you on the no, spot for now. No problem. Um, hello, everyone. A question or uh, to both of them? No, not really. I think uh, it's more that yeah, it was great. It's a great way to talk about nature conservation and all these issues. Uh, I would say, for me, um, loved the little video <laughs> and what Kathleen was talking about. Yeah, I can relate both how I got introduced to nature and got to loving it, and how. Uh, my kids, my two daughters also got involved. Uh, I mean, I would, I think a couple of things, it fits right into what we are pushing for at UNESCO in terms of uh, education for sustainability and educating on, on biodiversity and environmental issues that uh, you, in school, whether in school or outside of school, um, of course, the, the facts and figures are important, but, what is more important is kind of the social emotional type of relationship that we can cultivate, uh, not only between, well, us and nature, but also between ourselves, because we are, I mean, we are part of nature. We are, so I would say a couple, my comment would be, I would highlight a couple of things, a couple of C's. One is, of course, conservation. This is the topic of <laughs> what is there. <laughs> Uh, second one, second C is community. Again, we are part of a community. We have one planet. We are part of a community of living beings and living creatures around. Let's not forget that. Another C, communication. We have to share our our feelings and our you know enthusiasm to get more people involved and more people to change things. Um, another another C is uh, creativity. We have to find different ways of doing it. Uh, I would say, unfortunately, in too many schools around the world, the science class is so boring that the kids are I don't even think of doing a career in it. So let's change that. And then finally, I would say um, the final C is cooperation. We all have to join hands to do that. So this was a very quick comment on all this. And I'm going to have to jump up because I have a technical meeting about <laughs> some of these sessions. Thank you, so, Bernard. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you all of your colleagues for this wonderful conference uh, in, the, in, in Berlin, virtually. <laughs> and thank so, you for connecting with us. Great. Thank Take you. care. So we have, uh, if you need to retreat now for another meeting, we understand. But if you want to stay on, we're going to hear some responses from, um, from Kathleen and Wolf Run. Uh, I'm gonna ask my dear colleague, uh, Susanna, to also post the uh, flyer, which gives you the information on how to join the CEC and how to join Nature for All, because you may be interested in being part of these two powerful communities. We are strengthened when we are together. And so as we're taking questions, you'll also have a chance to, to get this information from a, a, a flyer. So I'm going to field the first question from, uh, from many people, but really Kaplan Wolfram, both of your stories dealt with young people and how connecting people to young, connecting young people to nature can change them. Can this work with an older audience? This is the question that's come forward. Let me, yes. let me to give a very quick example. In Hungary, there was a, a ministerial uh, platform who was uh, making decision on different forms of outdoor education as well. And I told them, I can't imagine to make this decision without having the similar experience, what we would like the children to, to receive. So I could convince them to have half an hour out in the mountains and we organized some, we played the same games as we play with the children. We did many things, activities in the forest. And what I've seen, these people still keep contact in the government. They are in still in different positions. They're not in that decision-making position. Some of them is, some of them not. But, but that experience was so bounding. So that means you can do with adults as well, even with 
governmental officials. So very, very short. So we are a multiplier academy. So we were teaching teacher to teach them. So you need the enthusiasm on the teacher's side first, and then you get the children. So of course it, it must, it works with uh, animals uh, to enthusiasm for the whole teacher crowd, and then they can transfer the two to children. So it's, it's obvious uh, a living animal is fascinating for all ages. Now, another question's come up and it's a, an interesting question. It says, do they need to be animals, mammals, bugs? Or could it be plants? Could it be nature? Could it be a tree? Could it be an ocean? So if you would both take a second to respond to this, because you both used very concrete uh, animal nature stories, but there's so much of nature that is out there. Well, just to give the short answer, because we pick up wildlife and we take back the animals to their natural habitats. And natural habitats are normally formed by plants and by their whole system. And this is about the system thinking. So if you take up an animal, you have to understand the whole subsistence at all to understand the natural wildlife. And it's already connected with plants and you need to know, you need to feed plants and everything. So it's, it's not only about animals. Yeah. One of my favorite fall in love stories was from a person who made natural playgrounds in the very busy city of Seoul, Korea. And he fell in love with nature when he saw a weed breaking through the cement in his city. And that weed gave life in what was an urban landscape. And he dedicated the rest of his life to bringing that greenery to other Seoul children. So I think we can find these nature for all stories in many places. I know, I know people who are in love with trees, who understand the tree's language. You can, yeah. It's every living creature that connects you. And if you are open to listen and to learn about and witness, it's growing. Yeah. Just look behind. This is the species which is able to break asphalt and cement and everything. So this is Teraxacum. It's exactly the plant. <laughs> <laughs> So Angus asks a very powerful question, and, and it's really about the, the suggestion from both of you is that one experience can change a whole person's life. And we know that's sometimes true, but he asks, well, how do we intensify these experiences so they're more likely to add, to, to take us into adulthood? so that they're really likely to have an impact on the way we shop, the way we vote, the way we educate, the jobs we take. All of us in this meeting probably fell in love with nature. We probably do these things, vote, shop, educate. But what are some of the ways you can reinforce or deepen that connection love interface? Hmm. I'm this is when we are talking about planning education strategically, because it's not enough to do with the kids and then let them to be socialized wherever they go. And, and we feel that we give our jobs, show them and everything is okay. So the education for sustainability is a lifelong learning. No, the learning for sustainability is a lifelong, uh, process, lifelong process. And we who are planning the systems and, and the strategies, we have to think how to give this momentum from different, for different ages. Usually we have sometimes program for adults or especially for grandmas, grandpas and children. And many times we are forgetting the young adult, the beginning of career adults, sometimes also the students at the university because they are graduating and they don't have these experiences. So we have to really think through how we keep this, the power of this momentum through the entire life and to refresh and go back and connect with everything what we are learning for. Well, from anything to add? Now, I just want to add that the children are multipliers as themselves. So we have the experience that they bring that into the families and they, well, we have the story that uh, we have about earthworm 
and a young boy started a compost farm and started a little business on his balcony. And of course, it was inf and influenced the whole family and the parents are <laughs> uh, were, were involved too. This is, why we suggest, this is why we suggest to teachers when they are inventing something in a class or in a camp or somewhere, engage the parents as well to be supportive for the initiation of the students, not to, not to cut their wings from the... I mean, this is where I think it's really important to keep in mind that, and we've seen this in many of the comments and in Catalan's talk, having someone you trust or love with you, a teacher, someone from your synagogue, your mosque, your church, some uh, uh, grandparent, and you'd be amazed how many times we hear grandparent stories. Grandparents are very powerful. Um, teachers and of course, parents themselves. But many of these do it many times. One of the first stories we heard was that the repeated action, my mother took me every night to the beach. My father would take me out to, to farm. Um, my grandfather took me hunting, fishing for walks. These repeated exposures intensify your chance of long-term sustained. The more you do it with people you love and the more often you do it, the more likely that connection is to lead to an aha moment, which you fall in love and then change everything. Yes. Do we, we, are, we are receiving... We are receiving examples, the zoos, botanical gardens, backyards with parents. Yep. Yes, all of them are a really, really good place to go. So we have still 50 people on. So the demand is speaking to itself. So I'm not going to cut us off. But since we still have 50, I'm going to ask if anyone wants to ask a question, not in writing, but in person. Come on, my wonderful CEC community, share a story. Who wants to speak? Because we'll have to unmute you. So Susanna will need to know. Jeet. Yeah, like I would, uh, like the, the, we explore like two different kind of perspectives, like when it comes to nature connection, like uh, you can explore the ocean, like by diving into it, you can go hundred feet and you can explore the ocean, the plethora of flora and fauna that we have over there. But there's another perspective as well. You can just uh, stand on the beach like scoop up one teaspoonful of the of the water and just put it under the microscope. That can also give you a different perspective. So like we, we as teachers, like we have to explore and open up these two different perspectives to the students, like so that they can, they can explore the way they want. So I love it. sometimes we have in the detail and I love the fact that Wolfram has this detailed shot behind him, because when you look into wildlife closely, it all becomes magical. Thank you, Jeet, my dear friend from India. Um, Kathleen? Thank you. Yep. I'm just reading the questions. <laughs> ah, okay. Now, we had a there is somebody who said, okay, the positive experiences that really leads to love. What about the negative experiences? And yes, you can be afraid of, you can have bad experiences. And uh, it's a question how you, how you analyze, analyze it, how you, how you see it, how it was. There are some fears that is really um, in place. You need it. You have to take care about your security, your life. You have to know how to, how to be safe. I, I don't have that, uh, that bad experiences, but now there is um, a research in Hungary. I haven't read the, uh, the findings that, yes, we have to be um, aware of if somebody has a bad experience, how not, how not to force their excursions or being in a camp or go somewhere if they don't want how to be a model like with the spider. I really love that story because of the spider that she had the fear, she had some experiences of preconcept, but because of the encouraging environment, because of the safe environment, because of the role model of the others, she could overcome. But it takes time, courage, understanding, 
agreeing and some guidance and love. I do think the social context is very different. Um, I am in my 50s. When I was young in Canada, my parents would grab me at six in the morning and throw me outside and I'd come back when it got dark. And all day we would play. And there was no fear of someone stealing me and taking me away. There was limited fear of abuse. It was much more uh, perceived safe environment. And that change in our culture to make us much more afraid for our children, plus the urbanization phenomena where many more people live in an urban context, makes it much more afraid, able to be afraid of nature. And I see we have an urban question that's just come up. I mean, I had a, a dear friend whose daughter grew up in an urban environment and she was afraid of mosquitoes. Made it really hard to take her into the, to see the beautiful forest when she was afraid of mosquitoes. So I do think as we look to these, we have to look at the barriers, fear, lack of acceptance, um, fear. I mean, many of us have spider fear regardless. Um, but you overcame that Wolfram, which is beautiful. Yes, but, but, but also the safety um, uh, issues uh, being outside. In, in a strong urban setting, you, you can't let your children to go out because of the traffic, because of the air pollution, because of the not safety, I don't know, because of stealing or, or many other danger. And, uh, and it's a social issue. It, for that it's okay let's go out hug a tree and love it so we have to then we have to find the situation what happened we know of course my experience as from europe but in a um, in a big city surrounding but there was huge traffic the citizens who lived in that city uh, worked together to partly close that street put some um, i don't know blocks into uh, reduce the parking spaces and turn that very uh, the, um, the the road which which has a very very uh, huge traffic and very bad air to to slow down and to have a kind of a playground ground on the street. It took several years, a lot of effort, but they made it. So it's but for doing anything, you have to analyze the circumstances, the causes, the possibilities. And then, then start to to solve the the key issue. Then you can go to this. Let's let's love and do something together. But in a classroom, you can have plants, you can have animals, you can have some good experiences. Thank you. We have a great question on what to do with people living in poverty. And I'm not going to get our our speakers to present. I'm going to ask my dear colleague from Kenya, Meg as I see your hand is also up, but will you take on the great question from Dr. Rajan and help unpack a little bit about what the wildlife clubs of Kenya have done, especially for poor Kenyans in urban environments to help connect them to nature? Thank you, thank you, Sean. Um, when somebody uh, has just mentioned about uh, experiencing or connecting with nature uh, being scary, it really reminded me of my childhood. Uh, Any time that a child misbehaved uh, or uh, if a child refused to sleep at bedtime in, uh, in my tribe, child is told that the hyena is going to come and eat them. So by the time a child is uh, growing up, they know that the hyena is the animal that eats them. So sometimes as parents, we, we can create the negative uh, image in children. But back to the wildlife clubs of Kenya, and um, I, I want to appreciate so much what uh, Kathleen has uh, taken us through. And um, I, I would like to add that influencing change towards sustainability is very, very important. But we have to rubber stamp this um, by impacting skills in nature restoration. And the wildlife clubs of Kenya, the organization that I work for, we have various activities, both in rural Kenya, in areas around and within key protected areas, and uh, also in other areas. We work with school kids 
from the very, very poor communities. And there's a lot of activities that uh, we have uh, uh, given the kids skills to, to be involved in. Uh, for, I'll just mention a few. For example, um, planting of uh, vegetables in uh, recyclable, in recycled tires, used tires. Just put soil in that and then uh, just beside their house, uh, they plant their vegetables there because he emphasized uh, the importance of food to these very, very poor communities. And um, kitchen in the sack, that is something else that uh, we have introduced. And when a child watches their vegetables sprouting slowly, they learn so much and they learn to appreciate, especially given that at the end of the day, these children are going to have food and they can share the same with, uh, with the family. There is something else that I've done, but uh, this will be very um, culture specific, specific in areas which are non-vegetarian. There are several schools, especially in areas where there is a lot of poaching. And you know, poaching begins when uh, they are very, very tiny. Um, rabbit keeping, mainly for consumption for the family, but this will only work in uh, places where they are not uh, very vegetarians. So there are so many other activities that kids can get involved in around the house, uh, in the urban areas, or even, uh, you know, in protected areas. There is a uh, butterfly keeping, uh, there is a uh, bird's protection by uh, putting in place a bird, but very simple using used plastics and so many others. I will put my email uh, address there so that if anybody is interested in knowing what else children and uh, generally young adults can get involved in, in conservation, regardless of whether it's in the rural areas or urban areas, I would like to share that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meg. So we've heard stories from, from Hungary, from Germany, now from Mexico, just so we are from, um, from Kenya. Yeah. So let's mix it up a bit. Rosi from Mexico. Hi, how are you? Well, I am uh, yes, currently in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I am in, in the Pacific Ocean in Puerto Vallarta, in the state of, of Jalisco. And this is um, one of the most important destinies, uh, touristic destinations in, in Mexico. But uh, here we, we suffer um, of, of uh, economic uh, and social degradation. Uh, when you get uh, back uh, to, uh, from, the, from the beach, like five kilometers uh, away from the beach, there are several communities that are segregated. So I, I worked uh, two years ago in a, in a school, uh, in a, a escuela primaria uh, of children for approximately five to uh, 12 years. Uh, so I gave them uh, classes of environmental topics and I gathered um, uh, information of, of La Conabio, that is the Commission of Biodiversity in Mexico. So I uh, showed them uh, this material I'm going to show you. Wow. Okay, so I have plenty of this type of material, like fruits and and this, this type of material was made of, of, by this commission that is really amazing what they, what they do. And I take uh, these, uh, these guides uh, to the children and they were so happy about it. And they, I, I gave them colors and I gave them uh, white papers and they started drawing and copying uh, the butterflies, uh, the different species of the ocean and from, from different types of, from different uh, yeah, uh, places of the world. Like for example, this is of birds. This is of birds uh, in the Pacific. And well, it was uh, an amazing experience and they were so, so, so happy. And I, of course, uh, when, when I showed them these guys and I uh, make them work uh, by like, four or five uh, each with one guide, like to, to work as a group, you no, know, and to share the colors and to share the, the guides. I also um, uh, played uh, music about environmental topics 
also by this Commission of Biodiversity. And I also share them stories. For example, uh, how do turtles uh, give uh, birth to little turtles and other stories like that. And so it was an amazing experience. And yes, we didn't go out of the classroom, but uh, here in Puerto Vallarta, well, the, the nature, the biodiversity is really, really rich. So I wanted to, um, they, they know more about what they uh, see often. For example, they have a lot of community gardens no, uh, so maybe they don't don't know about the species they are growing every day, like maize or other or uh, different fruits. So I wanted to learn more about what they see every day. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. That's a very rich story. We there's so much in there. And going back to Bernard C's, you took creativity um, and and put it in the mix. And we do see a lot that that combination of a trusted figure like you well-crafted materials like your guides combined with community and creativity can have a lasting result. Um, my dear friend, wow, you've got quite the name to, um, to pronounce. Oindrila. Oindrila. Yeah, hi, Oindrila. Kathleen pronounced it right. Thank you. Um, uh, what I want to share is uh, like my experience growing up, uh, one experience of a friend of mine who is a teacher teaching in school from about her students. And uh, so when we grew up in school, we had uh, eco clubs and we used to do a lot of uh, small plantation activities. We used to have small, uh, like small plants uh, on potted, potted plants. Uh, we took care of them. We plant. We had plantation activities in uh, some uh, urban areas uh, near about our school. So I belong from a poor family and uh, a very uh, lower middle class uh, background. And my school was uh, same uh, from uh, an urban city in uh, Kolkata in India. So here, what my question is, when we used to do all these activities under guidance of some of our teachers, it wasn't an activity well encouraged, not only in school, but also as I transitioned and studied uh, my bachelor's and master's in forestry, even in our own universities, these kind of co-curricular activities, more engagement with nature other than the curriculum was never so well encouraged. And uh, it is always that it is uh, at times it is not worthy of the time or it doesn't bring any change. Uh, like when we in school, we planted a lot of plants during plantation drives. When I grew up and studied forestry, I learned the way we planted or took care of them or rather did not take care of them was a wrong way. At childhood, we thought this is a great thing we are doing. But when we grew up, we learned that uh, at least I learned that I actually killed those plants. So in a longer way, what we are doing, is it a only momentary experience or it is going to take place throughout? That is my question. I uh, did uh, write it down and it was also discussed. My next question is what my friend faced as uh, she taught in school. Uh, she taught some children about gardening, urban gardening, and use of uh, local, uh, I mean, household seeds and watch them over, grow, uh, grow them. And then they came back and some of them had gardens in home. Then they said that, ma'am, you uh, asked us not to put this kind of chemicals to our uh, pots, but our parents say that these are the chemicals needed. So it's about chemical fertilizers and all those things. So and also some of them came back and said that our parents did not encourage it. So what I want to ask is, uh, is it only the students that we should uh, bring nature to? Is it not necessary to bring our society as a whole to nature too? Because we grow up, we learn nature, we get attached to nature, but as we grow up, we, are face, uh, we face that you have to choose reality. This is not reality. You are uh, being uh, like, uh, away from reality being so nature loving person. You have to be pragmatic. You have to be politically correct. You have to choose uh, the right career for you, even if that is uh, nature oriented, but a right career for you. So shouldn't we both uh, focus on education of children as well as adults? Because we 
as a, a grown up i feel i cannot put all the responsibility on the growing up children of, of responsibilities of a sustainable future on them it should be us as well so that's i'm going to do use your question your wonderful question as the last question for Wolfrad and Catlin, but Brahim has his hand up. So I'm gonna quickly give the floor to Brahim and then hand over for a closing from Wolfrad and Catlin. But Brahim. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sun, and uh, uh, congratulations to Catlin and Wolfgang for this presentation. Well, I want just to share with you some uh, specific uh, uh, education for, for children in, in our region. You know, we have three, three main uh, subjects that to some. We, we, we go to the Koran, and in the Koran there is some plants and animals that maybe for the so, so, society are sacred. So we, we try to uh, uh, explain to the children the importance of these trees or these animals. But also we have in, in the rural area, we have farm animals as uh, in, uh, now, cows, sheep, uh, donkey. But in, in, in uh, urban uh, city, in the cities, we develop the concept of a new, uh, a new animal of company. That means turtle, mice, uh, guinea pig, uh, butterfly, frog. So this, this, this concept is now in, in schools, in urban, and we, 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 see, we see the development of this uh, uh, category of animals that uh, children, uh, ch child or children, they like. And uh, the, the parents, they have to take care about this. And sometimes they, they have to consult the vet for any, any uh, consultation for uh, uh, how to feed the animals, how to take care of animals. And the child is there with the parents and really he know how to take, it, take care about it. And this is important. And we see also this, this uh, uh, in backyard, we now we develop what we call uh, a, a med medicinal aromatic plants. Many, many family, they got a, a backyard where they put some uh, plants from uh, traditional use that uh, like uh, medicinal or cosmetic or, or, or medical. So they, they, we, we, we develop this and this is important now in our schools and they have uh, uh, in, in, uh, as a director of uh, botanic garden, many schools, they come, the director come to meet me and say, yes, we, 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 we create a small garden for the children can, for the, in the school. Can you, can you help us with some plants that we can plant? But I said, yes, but uh, one condition, you have to take care about these plants. You have to water them. N not in, during the holidays, you have not to abandon them, but you have to take care when the school is closed, but this is important to keep the plant alive. And that's uh, now is quite uh, developed in some schools and it's, it's a new concept. Thank you very much. That's all. Shokran Brahim, Thank I you. love those. I love the fact that you have to keep it alive. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So Thank my... you. Okay. Thank you. My final hard question to Wolfram and to Catlin, and thank you all for staying half an hour longer. But if during their final answer, can I ask Susanna to put up the form again? We really want you to join the CEC and join us as a community of, of educators and a community of uh, communicators. Please join CEC if you're an individual. Your organizations can join um, Nature for All. Nature for All is about institutions or organizations. So there's one of these for individuals, one of these for your organization. And the link will go up in a minute. The final question, Wolfram and Kathleen, you've talked a lot about how to make one environmentalist, a, a child, uh, how do we make a culture of conservation? How, based on everything we've heard, how do we create in our whole community a commitment to conservation? It's not an easy one, so I'm gonna let Kathleen go first. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what, I, what I always try to encourage the, the conservationist the education decision makers, when we are talking about ESD, it's, uh, we are creating change. We are aiming to create change. 
And for that, we have to know how change happens, how, it, how our life changed during the some several years and what kind of changes we are envisioning. And this is why in the ESD community, we say that the teacher has to be equipped educators, I would say, and educator is everyone who would like to support someone's learning, who would like to support someone's behavioral change towards conservation, towards sustainability. And, and we have to equip, empower, equip ourselves with the knowledge about change, uh, with the being able to analyze the trends and then envision what kind of change we would like to see. And then at the same time to know how change happens, what reactions we, are, we can expect, how to deal with and how to be more. I would like to offer a really deep thank you to everyone for spending your time with us. I loved it. A special thank you to Kaplan and Wolfram for your stories, your insights, your wisdom. Remember, we want you to join the Nature for All family. We want you to join CEC and the details will be up on the screen after so you can get the direct links. We want to see you there. But mostly, each of you, please keep up your work of inspiring a culture of conservation and care. Thank you, everyone.